Okay. So thank you so much for meeting with me. Pierre Richard, you are Bitcoin expert, um, Bitcoin maxi, Bitcoin educator. Um, I come to you for my like Bitcoin news every day, but is there anything else that you want to use to like describe yourself or just to let people know who you are? Yeah, sure. So um, by, by, by education, I'm an accountant. So I got my bachelor and master in accounting at UT Austin, Hookham. And I uh, then went into public accounting, um, but I didn't like the the uh, the bookkeeping part, right? The data entry, sitting in front of the computer, copy pasting. Uh, so I got into software development, um, and uh, I self taught myself on online um, how to how to program. Enjoyed that a lot, and now I'm uh, at at Kraken, one of the largest uh, Bitcoin exchanges in the world and I do a mix of strategy and product there. Um, and so part of that obviously is, is doing shows like this of uh, helping uh, folks get uh, onboarded onto what Bitcoin is, what its value proposition is. Um, and I'm also on the advisory board for one of the largest publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies called Riot Blockchain. Okay, cool. Um, so first thing I want to ask you is we hear all the time Bitcoin is being referred to as digital gold, gold 2.0. My question for you is, A, do you agree with that? And B, how would you define Bitcoin? Yeah, um, so I, I agree with it as a metaphor, but the problem with metaphors is that they quickly break down. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a good place to start in terms of how are you um, going to interact with Bitcoin? Um, and I think that the the most profitable way to interact with Bitcoin so far has been to just buy and hold it. Yep. And that's similar with gold, right? You just you buy it and you sit on it. Um, now, then we can get into the differences of why is it 2.0, right? Why is it the upgraded version of gold and what does that entail? So um, I kind of look at it from three angles. Uh, one is how how do you receive the asset and uh with with bitcoin it's actually it's unique in the sense that it's digital so you don't have to have a physical address if you're buying gold like you got to ship it somewhere uh and, and same thing if you're opening a bank account you have to have a physical address so already actually that excludes a lot of people um for for whatever reason that you know that's just not uh something that they uh can, can use um and so you have a digital address and you create what's called a private key, which is like a password, random numbers and letters, and uh, you, cr you create addresses from this private key. Now, uh, your wallet, your Bitcoin wallet does this for you, so you don't have to think about it yourself. And there's lots of Bitcoin wallets you can uh, get on your smartphone or on your desktop computer, um, and you can download this software and use it without getting anyone's permission. So you don't have to apply for a Bitcoin wallet and provide your social security number or anything like that. Uh, it's permissionless. And that's a huge advantage over basically any other kind of liquid asset out there. Um, so that's on the receiving side. Then on the, on the holding side, then you can hold it in a number of different ways. The uh, commonly, seen most secure way of holding Bitcoin is with one of these. This is a hardware wallet and it uh, has a little USB connector to it and you connect it to your computer um, and you you very meticulously follow the instructions. Mm -hmm. And um, this has the private key inside the device. And the advantage of that is that um, it's purpose built for it. So it's more secure than having the private key on your phone or on your desktop or laptop computer. Um, and then the, the cool thing too, is that you can combine multiple, let's see, I've got a, I've got a ledger here uh, too. You combine um, different uh, hardware wallets and you can do what's called a multi-sig, which uh, you know, our, our generation hasn't used checkbooks with multiple signatures, I don't think. But the concept is that um, in order to spend the Bitcoin, you have to have both devices. And that way you can split up where they are and it makes things more redundant and more secure. 
Um, wow. Yeah, now it's a little bit advanced because I think that for, for most beginners, they're just going to hold their Bitcoin with a third party, whether yeah. it's Cash App or Coinbase. Yeah. yeah, and that's totally fine. The advantage Bitcoin has is that it gives you options. Right. You have the option to hold it yourself. You don't necessarily have to exercise that option because ultimately it does take a little bit of due diligence, technical skill to take the Bitcoin into your own possession. And, you know, it's understandable that um, you want to outsource that to a company. But, you know, wh whenever you want to, you have the freedom to withdraw the Bitcoin to your own uh, private keys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'll get I will get there one day. And I keep having people that are more into Bitcoin than me telling me I need to do it. I'm like, listen, I don't trust myself enough with it yet. Like I'm still just like my strategy is just having it on different exchanges in different wallets to at least split it up and like diversify that way. But like hopefully I get there eventually. That's pretty reasonable. And the other thing that you can do is put a little bit of Bitcoin onto a hardware wallet. You don't have to move all of your Bitcoin onto it. And so then you can just start practicing and, and right. getting more comfortable with it is another yeah. um, thing to look at. Okay. So is there a brand of hardware wallet that you recommend? Yeah, there is. So um, I really like the cold card and uh, you can get the cold card at coldcardwallet.com. Now, be very careful when you're buying a hardware wallet to buy it straight from the manufacturer. Um, otherwise, uh, somebody could fiddle with it uh, in between. And, and this is the cold card. And it kind of looks like a, a calculator. I love it. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's, it's, very, it's, it's reasonably small and, and discreet. And um, yeah, it's, it's worked well for me. Now, uh, there's others as well. So there's the, uh, the, the ledger here. Um, that is made by a French company. And then the, the Trezor is also fairly well known uh, as well and works very well. So I think all three are a good option. If I were to rank them, I'd say Cold Card, Trezor, and then Ledger. And there's there's others as well, um, Kobo Wallet. I just don't have one, um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of choices. Just make sure that you're you're buying straight from the manufacturer that you have the correct website. There's a lot of phishing websites that are that are fakes that are trying to scam you out of your Bitcoin, and that's that's one of the challenges of this space. Yeah. Um, and and so I, uh, if you're not comfortable navigating that, then uh, obviously using Coinbase, using Cash App, uh, is a, a way to hold hold Bitcoin without holding the private keys, um, and you have the option there for you. Yeah. Now. Okay. The third um, part of Bitcoin that I think is uh, important to highlight in terms of how it's different from gold is then when you're ready to send it, you can send it anywhere in the world 24-7 to, to anyone who has a Bitcoin address who gives it to you. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a relative who's abroad, you can just send them the Bitcoin and you don't have to like mail gold to them or uh, do a wire transfer and then it gets there in three days mm -hmm. um it gets there in 10 minutes and uh it's really uh easy and convenient uh compared to the alternatives yeah do you see a future where bitcoin is actually being used to buy and sell a lot of things because i know right now it's mostly you're just we're just holding it. it's very volatile but do you see that in the future so today i'd say like 10 percent of users are actually transacting with really? it. Um, That's more yeah. than I thought. Yeah, because you're in the 90% and you probably know people who are in the 90% um, okay. because the, the people in the 10% are folks who, they, they, they use Bitcoin as a payment system of last resort where they just don't have access to the traditional banking system. Wow. And so they, they don't really have any other good choices. Wow. Um, their alternative would be like literally putting cash in the mail. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, interesting. So, yeah, um, and then there's there's um, folks who are traders, right? Who are sending Bitcoin around as part of their trading strategies to to different venues, and um, that's not necessarily something we see, uh, you know, as, as non traders, as as hodlers. Um, and, and the, the lastly, there's folks who are um, moving their Bitcoin around because they're using it as collateral. So they, they might be borrowing dollars um, against their Bitcoin. And so that's why they're transferring their Bitcoin to to a lender um, for, for putting it up as collateral. Got it. 
What do you say to the naysayers that are all talking about Bitcoin being used for like underground criminal activity type stuff? So that's definitely going on to an extent. Um, it as a percentage of the total activity in Bitcoin, it has been on the downtrend. Um, you know, if we look back at during the Silk Road days, it was much bigger percentage of the activity. Now, I would note that you know when Silk Road was a like dark net drug market on uh, using Bitcoin, when it got shut down the exchange rate of Bitcoin, its price went up. And so the idea that um, Bitcoin's value is being propped up by the dark net, I think is a fallacy. Mm. It actually causes the, the value to go down because people are spending the Bitcoin. So when people spend Bitcoin, it causes the value to go down. Right. When people are holding Bitcoin and buying it, then obviously the value goes up. Cool, okay. and. The other naysayers that are talking about um, the environmental impact of Bitcoin, this is something that I'm still trying to understand. I would love to just hear your take on that. Is it bad for the environment? Is it a better option than a lot of other things? Like, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I can speak to like what, what I've seen. Um, and so I'm, I'm on the advisory board for, for Riot Blockchain and they're a big Bitcoin miner. So they mine Bitcoin in an aluminum factory in upstate New York that was abandoned and that is adjacent to a hydroelectric dam. And so all of their electricity comes from this dam um, and it's in Messina, New York. And so there to me, it's like, it's both green, right? It's a renewable energy source. Um, and it's also revitalizing the Rust Belt where this aluminum factory shut down because of outsourcing and now it's employing people and bringing business back to to this area of the country. Um, so I think that it shows that there's um, there certainly is Bitcoin mining going on that uses uh, fossil fuels, whether it's coal or natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, but the process of Bitcoin mining, if you look at the the mechanics of it, it uses electricity. It's agnostic as to where that electricity comes from. Mm -hmm. So um, if the concern is about climate change, and that's a totally valid concern, then we should be focusing on what is actually emitting the carbon emissions. Right. And that is the power plant. It's not the Bitcoin mining facility. And so uh, carbon taxes on coal-fired power plants make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Carbon taxes on Bitcoin mining uh, infrastructure, that doesn't really make sense because the Bitcoin miners are just taking electricity from any source, could be hydroelectric, could be solar, et cetera. And they're doing all of these calculations in order to make Bitcoin work. Um, and that's um, the, the environmental impact of that is, is not uh, substantial. It's 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 nil, right? It's just emitting heat if right. you actually look at what's, what it's doing. Yeah. Okay, cool. So whenever I get that question, I'm just going to take this video clip and be like, here, this is what Pierre said. But yeah, <laughs> thank you. That, that's really helpful. Um, what else did I want to ask you? Um, oh, what, what do you have to say to people who are feeling like they already missed the boat on Bitcoin? Yeah. Um, so when when I got interested in Bitcoin in 2013, I felt that way. I felt like I'd missed the vote. In 2013. So this is like almost 10 years ago. Yeah. We could see you would talk with people who'd been there since like 2011 and 2010. So there's always someone who's like older than you. Yeah. Um, and then the oldest person, you know, Satoshi in you know, 2009. Um, and um, my my view is that Currently, adoption is maybe like it's it's still less than one percent uh, of what total adoption will be. Um, we're still early. Yeah, we're still very early. And uh, Bitcoin, you know, yesterday or the day before was making all time highs. So um, I, I think that there's still a lot of upside. And in fact, I would argue that um, Bitcoin, even when it reaches a hundred percent adoption its purchasing power is still going to be increasing because the supply of Bitcoin is fixed, right? There will only be 21 million Bitcoin, but the goods and services produced by the economy, that's always growing. 
And so the ratio between that is kind of Bitcoin's purchasing power. And so I actually think Bitcoin's purchasing power will always be increasing, um, which is kind of the the opposite of of the dollar or fiat, where yeah. you know you're always losing purchasing power um, because they're always printing more dollars to hand out to their friends in Washington D.C. <laughs> So true. Yeah. Okay. So there is no limit. So you're not late. Everybody needs to get into it whenever they can, but earlier is always better. Um, okay. So I feel like you're going to hate this question, but I just need to ask, do you have a price target for this year? And I know like I've seen things before where your response is like one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin, you know, like you don't even think in US dollars, but like if you had to, what would you say? Yeah. Well, first off, I'll clarify the one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin because it's kind of flippant, right? Uh, um, because you, people say, well, that's true of anything, right? That uh, yeah. what, one dollar equals one dollar. What, what I mean by that is that when you hold one Bitcoin or a fraction of a Bitcoin, I should emphasize that you can hold one, mil- one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, it's called a Satoshi, mm-hmm. um, that you're holding a fixed percentage of the total possible supply of 21 million. So you, if you have one Bitcoin, you hold one 21 millionth of the total supply, and that's right. that's um, you're not getting diluted out of that over time. Ever. Now, in terms of Bitcoin's exchange rate with the dollar, um, it's very volatile. Uh, however, if we look at um, the trend, after every four years, Bitcoin seems to have this big mega cycle. And the mega cycle, it starts at a certain price. So so, um, this one started around like $3,500 in December of 2018. And then it slowly builds up. And as it's building up, it builds up this momentum where then people start piling in. And at the end, you have this this parabolic vertical elevator up, right? And that was like December 2017, Mm -hmm. where Bitcoin, because in the previous cycle, Bitcoin started at $200 and it went up to $20,000. So it went up 100x. Yeah. So um, if we were to hypothesize that Bitcoin's going to go up 100x again from its low, that would put it at like $350,000. Now, is it going to do that? And when? Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, I, I, what I do see is that there is massive demand that has not bought Bitcoin yet, but is in the process of setting themselves up to buy it. Mm-hmm. So you have large Fortune 500 companies. Yep. These companies are very slow to move, right? They've got boards of directors. They've got committees. They've got finance departments. So things take time for them to, to move on things. Now, um, there are some that are very nimble, like Tesla, that just bought $1.5 billion worth. But that's, you know, Tesla is a very uh, young, energetic company. <laughs> the, the stodgy old companies, they're going to take a little bit longer, but they're, they're going to buy Bitcoin. And so if you're able to buy some today, uh, yeah, there might be some volatility and it might go up or down 20% or 50%. So, you know, don't freak out over that. Right. But you're buying ahead of what I see is this massive wave of corporate and institutional buyers who are just moving slowly, but they're moving. Right. And they're going to be accumulating this year, next year, and the year after. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that if I were to put a number for this year, and I always, I'm going to get burnt on this. In the bull market, I get burnt where it goes over the number. Uh, And so if I say, uh, I think it's going to go to 100K, um, but we're already on the cusp of hitting 50K. It's about to be 50. (laughs) Like, it hasn't been lower than 30 this whole year, right? Maybe just by a hair? By a hair, yeah. Um, And so, yeah, we're in a bull market. And so in a bull market, it's very hard to to try to time things. and what I emphasize is that folks should be thinking about this long term. Right. Um, and that's what I like about Bitcoin is that you'll hear one of the criticisms of Bitcoin is that it's boring, that you just you just buy and hold it and it doesn't change. Right. Because it's not uh, to them. It's like it's not innovating. And so they get attracted to all the altcoins. Mm. I actually think that's an advantage in that if I buy Bitcoin today, I know that it's not going to change for like years and years and years. And so that is really comforting to me because I'm thinking about this long term. And 
that you don't have to buy in like 100% on day zero. Right. You can buy a little bit with every paycheck and build up your stack of Bitcoin. Uh, so then you'll in four years, you'll look on it and you'll be like, wow, I can't believe that it has increased in value so much. Yeah. So for people right now who haven't yet bought, and I feel like there are people that are waiting for it to like have a dip, but they don't even know how low the dip is. It's kind of like the point is don't wait for that dip because it's always going to be increasing, especially if you're ahead of all of these companies who haven't yet bought into it, like just do it now and con and on a continuous basis. Right. Yeah. Trying to time dips uh, is really hard. Uh, and I've tried to time the market myself uh, and with very lackluster results, even, and I, I'm like an amateur, professional traders have a hard time. Professional traders are happy when they are correct 55% of the time. Um, <laughs> and and they're, they're sitting in front of their computer staring at the screen all day. You know, most people don't wanna do that. And yeah. so I really recommend folks to just buy, forget about it um, and set up a recurring buy. So yeah. that you're, you don't even have to think about logging in to, to buy a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. And my last question is, what is the best place to learn for people who want to learn more? Personally, I literally every day, I just go on Twitter, search the Bitcoin hashtag, see the top stuff. Your stuff is always there. It's you, Pomp, Michael Saylor, Tyler Winklevoss. <laughs> but is like, is what would you recommend? So it, it depends on how deep they want to go, right? Yeah. And um, I, I think that just to, to, to keep tabs on the industry, I think Twitter is a great clearinghouse of information. Uh, so I'd, I'd highly recommend Twitter. Um, but if you want to go deeper and really learn about how Bitcoin works under the hood, um, then there's a book that is semi-technical. It's called Grokking Bitcoin, G-R-O-K-K-I-N-G. Uh, Bitcoin. And um, that book, it, it's really, it, it gets into how Bitcoin works um, from a, uh, a technical perspective, but in plain English. So you can kind of follow along and skip, you know, what kind of goes in too deep and whatnot. And the reason I recommend that book is because uh, ultimately, there's kind of two ways of approaching Bitcoin. One is you just log into Coinbase, you buy some, you forget about it. And um, then you don't have to overthink it. Uh, the other is like, you want to understand Bitcoin yeah. and you want to get like what's going on. And I don't really think that uh, to me, there's no man's land in between where like you have half baked ideas about um, how Bitcoin works yeah. uh, that uh, are, are wrong and might cause you to do things that like you might try to use your own hardware wallet and accidentally shoot yourself in the foot because you didn't really actually understand what was going on. Uh huh. Okay, cool. That's so, so helpful. Um, so I guess I would just say, is there anything else that you want to share? Like, what do you want the world to know about Bitcoin that you haven't already said, or maybe you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that some parts of Bitcoin are never going to change, like the monetary policy of 21 million Bitcoin. Other parts of Bitcoin are, are innovating. And so uh, Bitcoin's um, increasingly programmable. So it has advanced scripts, smart contracts on it. Um, and so for folks who are interested in that side of things, um, there's a, a very long rabbit hole to go down uh, in terms of learning more. Um, and then the other is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's both from the mainstream media, unfortunately, where they have uh, points of views that are not necessarily correct or accurate. They're kind of promoting a certain angle to it. Um, but also from financial professionals who to them, Bitcoin is something really new. Right. And it's um, they haven't done their own due diligence on it yet. And so they have some preconceived notions about it. And um, that's that's also a challenge. Now, I'm I'm married to a financial planner, uh, and so I, I talk about this with her a lot. Um, but uh, not everyone uh, is married to a Bitcoin expert. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, not yet, at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And for everyone that's watching, go follow Pierre on Twitter. You will learn so much. Um, but yeah, Pierre, honestly, thank you. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. And this, this was a great set of questions. Oh, awesome. Thanks. All right. I'll see you on Twitter. Bye. Bye.